Ladies and gentlemen, um, good evening. My name is Michael Hutt. I'm the director of the South Asia Institute here at SOAS, and it's very good to, uh, to host this, this function this evening, um, the launch of uh, To End a Civil War, Norway's Peace Engagement in Sri Lanka by, by Mark Salter, and thank you all very much for coming. Um, a couple of announcements. This, this function is being hosted jointly by ourselves, the South Asia Institute, and also the SOAS uh, Center for International Studies and Diplomacy. Um, as we were saying earlier, if you don't have a banner, uh, all publicity uh, is always sought on these things. Um, so that's the hosting arrangement. Um, I should also warn you that um, we are filming this event, so if you wish to lurk in the shadows, um, please do feel free to do so. Um, also to say that copies of the book are on sale this evening uh, from Hearst Publishers at the special discounted price of £15 per copy rather than 25 but you will have to have cash uh, to pay for that. And also after the, after the uh, formal proceedings are over, the Norwegian Embassy has very uh, kindly provided us with some refreshment uh, which will be served outside in the foyer at 8 o'clock at the latest, we hope perhaps a little earlier if we finished, finished before, before time. So my job is a very simple one. It's simply to uh, um, introduce this evening's speakers and to chair the following discussion. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce to you first uh, the author, uh, Mark Salter, who is an independent consultant working on democracy, conflict, reconciliation, and diversity management. Over the last 25 years, he has worked in a wide range of professional settings, including international NGOs, research institutes, and intergovernmental organizations. Before becoming an independent consultant, from 2000 to 2010, 2010 he was a senior staff member of the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, ID, IDEA. He led the Institute's global work on reconciliation and two major research projects, uh, namely traditional justice and reconciliation after violent conflict, learning from African experiences, and secondly, customary governance and democracy building. So a warm welcome to Mark Salter. Um, we also have... <laughs> We're also very fortunate to have with us this evening um, two uh, members of the, the, the peace effort, the two, two, uh, two players in the, in the engagement of, of the time that is described in the book. Um, the first is Mr. Vidar Helgeson, who is the Minister and Chief of Staff at the Office of the Prime Minister in Norway, who is also responsible for EU affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Helgeson was State Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 2001 to 2005, and in that role, he led the Norwegian diplomatic team, which facilitated the peace process between the Sri Lankan government and the LTTE. From 2006 until he started his current role as minister in 2013, he was Secretary General of, the, of IDEA, previously mentioned, the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance uh, in Stockholm. And we also have with us uh, Mr. Eric Solheim, um, who is currently OECD Development Assistant Committee. Um, uh, Sutta, you've said he's a committee in my notes. Yeah. He's the chair <laughs> of, the, of the OECD's Development Assistant Committee. He's also serving as the United Nations uh, Environment Programme Special Envoy for Environment conflict and disaster. And Mr. Solheim was Norway's special envoy to Sri Lanka from 2000 to 2006. Um, and from 2005 to 6, he was also uh, Minister for uh, International Development. Um, and since 2007 to 2012, he held the combined portfolio of Norway's Minister of the Environment and International Development. So a warm welcome to our two guests from Norway, please. Last but very much not least, uh, Dr. Sutaharan Nadaraja is a lecturer in international relations, relations here at SOAS, and his research examines how the international community secures itself against emergent threats to international order through global frameworks which combine themes of security, development, and liberal governance. 
Now, before joining the SOAS faculty in 2010, uh, Dr. Nadaraja completed his PhD in the Department of Politics and International Studies here, and then lectured in international security at the University of Sussex. His doctoral research focused on the Norwegian peace process in Sri Lanka. So I think we can welcome you to the BGLT as well. So, so the format of this evening is, is that first I will ask uh, Mark Salter to give us a, a brief account of, of, of his book and how it, how it came to be written. And, and then we'll turn to the panelists to each give their own, their own comments on, on the topic and the theme of the book and the way it has approached those themes. Um, then I'll ask Mark to respond to those comments before we throw it open to, to Q&A from, from those who are here. So first over to you, Mark. Good evening. Um, had a chance to say hello to quite a few of you in the foyer. Those I haven't, um, hello to you too. Um, well, this will be brief. Um, what I'm going to just first say something about is how this book came about, as Professor Hutt mentioned. I mean, obviously, there's lots could be said about this, but the fundamental is this, that um, uh, after the end of the conflict in Sri Lanka, I think there was a, a discussion that went on primarily between Eric Sulheim and Vidal Helgeson, but not exclusively them, um, which was this a discussion about, well, there we go, this is what's happened, um, how do we respond, if at all? And I think part of what they felt after the reflection needed to be provided as a response was an account of what the Norwegians got up to in Sri Lanka, an account that was telling the story from their point of view, but was also giving the views of others, key actors, on how the Norwegians had performed. And, I mean, the, the, the wish to tell your story is universal, but I think in this case it was enhanced by the fact that in the latter stages of the war in Sri Lanka, the Norwegians became, to a great extent, the kind of whipping boys and girls of... Um, nationalist forces in Sri Lanka, actually on both sides. So basically, if anything went wrong, blame it on the Norwegians. Um, and I kind of thought of that last week, you know, there's been a big thing in the UK here about, uh, um, at least in some circles, with, uh, with Jeremy Corbyn as the Labour Party leader. Blame it on Corbyn, you know, climate change, blame it on him. Sort of temperature not to your liking, blame it on him. It's a bit the same in Sri Lanka. Something went wrong, blame it on the Norwegians which, of course, was somewhat unreasonable, to put it mildly. Um, so I was approached by Vidar, my former boss at IDEA. Um, he muttered to me earlier, was this nepotism, questionably? I hope it wasn't. I don't think it was. I think they wanted a story told, and they thought I might be in a good position to do it. Um, it's true that I knew the country reasonably well. I'd been visiting Sri Lanka since the early... Uh, 2000s. I first visited just after the CFA, ceasefire agreement in 2002, and was back many times thereafter. So the book is basically an attempt to tell the story of Norway's engagement in Sri Lanka. Um, and it's, but it's not a hagiographic effort. It's not, at least I don't think it is, presenting the Norwegians uncritically as sort of peace saviours of the nation, um, which they certainly weren't actually, but even whether they were or not, that's not how they perceived it and that's not how it worked. So it's attempting to tell a story. Um, and I would like you, those of you who actually read the book, to look at it that way. This is a story. Read it as a story. Think, tell me if you think it's a reasonable story. And I'll just add there that I was quite pleased. I did a couple of interviews today at the BBC. One of them was something called Asia Network, which is a um, radio programme aimed at the Asian community in the UK. And my, I got an hour's worth of grilling. An hour. <laughs> Incredible. When does that happen these days on any media program? An hour on anything. Short attention span media doesn't work like that. Um, but it was a, the guy who interviewed me was a young Sinhalese, well, a British Lankan, I mean, Sinhalese. And he um, said to me in his best South London tones, he said, 
oh, you know, Mark, when I got this book, it's like I got this big thing. I thought, oh, this is academic. I don't know if I really want to read this. He said, but you know what? It was a really good story. Now, to me, that was praise, praise of the highest order. That's what I wanted to hear because that's what I've tried to do. Now, I'm just, obviously, I can't go through all the issues involved. I just want to touch on a few. The first is, how and why did the Norwegians get involved in Sri Lanka? Well, the first point to make is that the Norwegian engagement in Sri Lanka goes back a lot further than many people, even those who know the country and know the situation, realise. Um, by my estimate, the, the, the beginnings of Norwegian engagement in Sri Lanka go back to the mid-60s, when the first development assistance programmes the development assistance programs were, were developed. And they were modest to begin with, they were NGO um, assistance. But over time they built up, and after 1997, 1977 there was a bilateral development assistance agreement, and things picked up. So, without going to the details, the point there is that Norway didn't just arrive on the doorstep. It had been camping out in the garden, maybe even living around the corner for some time previously. So relationships, trust, was built up over time. And I think that's an important message about peace building, about peace facilitation, is that it works best, or at least the parties are most likely to really work with you if you've actually got a tra track record of involvement and engagement and support. Um, the second thing about the Norwegian engagement is that clearly what facilitated it was a broader strategic decision that Norway took in the aftermath of the Cold War to get involved in peace facilitation, peace mediation, or peace diplomacy, in fact, as it's officially described. You know, and I've got this very explicitly in the book from a number of people I interviewed, that they kind of sort of almost spotted an opportunity that in the aftermath of the Cold War, small states or smaller states could start doing things in the mediation facilitation area that were simply not possible as long as conflicts were hostage to the superpower conflict. So in fact, the earliest Norwegian engagement that I'm aware of um, was in Guatemala when uh, the Norwegians hosted a meeting, a meeting of the contact group between the government and the rebels in, in early 1990. Um, but things kind of picked up thereafter and particularly after the 1993 uh, Oslo process, as it's known, between uh, Palestinians and, and Israel, um, which at least at the time was perceived as a huge success and all those kind of iconic images of Shimon Peres and Yasser Arafat sort of on the White House, White House lawn and so on and so forth. How that's relevant to Sri Lanka is it really provided a kind of calling card for Sri Lanka, for, for the Norwegians. And in fact, in my interviews with a number of the government officials at the time, it's pretty clear that they, they treated the Oslo, they regarded the Oslo process and its apparent success as a reason to consider Norway as a potential facilitator in a way that they might not have done, you know, otherwise. Okay, third point, um, again, without going into too many details, um, the official start of Norway's facilitation involvement in Sri Lanka officially really comes in December 1999 when the then president, Chandrika Kumaratunga, um, survives an assassination attempt on her by the LTT. She loses sight in her right eye, but she survives. And on the backs of that, wins an election, what would otherwise perhaps have been a very closely contested election. Um, and in the immediate aftermath, uh, is interviewed by the BBC and just announces to the world, you know what, folks, the Norwegians, we've chosen them to facilitate the peace process. Now, Eric will tell you, if you ask him at least, that the people most gobsmacked by that announcement were the, precisely the Norwegians. They had no idea that she was planning to make this announcement publicly. But there it was. It was out in public domain thereafter. My point here is simply that even preceding that, there were probably three or four occasions starting in 1990 and going through the 90s where the Norwegians were asked by the government and then eventually even by the LTT to get involved in some form of mediation, backdoor channel of communication between the two sides. In other words, Norway, by the time it got involved in the genuine business of peace facilitation, already had a serious history in Sri Lanka of economic development, engagement, of political support, 
and of requests to facilitate discussions. So there's a context, and I think that's important to understanding the Norwegian role, and it may be an important lesson for those who try to engage themselves in facilitation efforts elsewhere. It doesn't come for, for free. It requires homework, patient support, and work. Okay, I will just finish off with a couple. Um, this is really relating to the final chapter of the book, which after this long sort of story that I tell, gets into the question of lessons learned. You know, what do the different actors in Sri Lanka see, see in, the, in the effort to facilitate a peace um, agreement? What do they see as key lessons from that Norwegian effort? And as I say, this is, this is just picking up a couple of key ones. Number one, um, and you know, Eric and Vidar, tell me if you think I'm putting this too strongly or disagree or whatever. I mean, I'm still gonna say it because that's what I think. Um, the Norwegians misread the political context when the, when the initial ceasefire and uh, subsequent peace process took off. What do I mean by that? What I mean is very specifically that they thought that it was sufficient to have one side of the similar political equation on their side, and that side was the government of Ranul Wickramasinghe, then Prime Minister, Prime Minister again today. They thought that was sufficient. But it just simply wasn't. They didn't have President Kumaratunga on their side. They didn't have, the government didn't have her on their side. And that was an accident waiting to happen. It was a bomb waiting to be dropped, which is indeed what happened at the end of 2003. Chandrika Kumaratunga, on the backs of the LTT's um, interim self-government um, proposal, uh, suddenly declared a state of emergency, uh, took three ministries under her own control, including the defense ministry, basically just scuppered the entire process. Now, you know, and that was fundamentally a product of the failure to develop a bipartisan political consensus in support of the peace process on the Sinhalese side. I think we know from peace processes around the world instinctively that you have to have all parties minimally on board with the process. If you don't, the chances of the thing falling through are heightened. And I think that is a key lesson from Sri Lanka. I mean, in the Norwegians' defense, they were not alone in making this mistake. They were not alone in making that assessment. It was probably how most people, especially in the international community, viewed the situation. There was a prime minister who was pro-peace, who was pushing things, who was making them happen. Let's go with him. Let's make it happen. You know, and let's not think about the lame duck president who's sniping from the sidelines. Peace processes don't work like that. You have to bring everybody on board. Final point, the international context. And this is something that Vidar Helgeson has written and very eloquently about and spoke also, and it's, I hope, reflected in the book. Um, the post-9-11 environment, the war on terror, you know, these were things that had fundamental impacts in Sri Lanka and impacts that were not fully appreciated at the time. In particular, the war on terror provided an opportunity for the Sri Lankan government in the form of Mahinda Rajapaksa once he was elected as president in late 2005, as indeed in many other countries we know, to dress up a long-standing ethnic or civil conflict in the colors of a global war on terror. That's what Rajapaksa did and you have to say it was immensely successful, at least successful in terms of immediate objectives. And we know, I mean, even after the end of the conflict, for a brief period at least, Sri Lanka was selling the Sri Lanka model of combating terrorism as a way to go forward and talking to the Nigerians about how to combat Boko Haram and so on and so forth. I think maybe that I'll finish with this, that the, that the real message there is that you know, when you're doing your facilitation or your peace efforts, attention to the broader parameters of the international order and how they may or may not impact on your efforts locally or domestically is absolutely essential. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Just to finish by saying I want to thank Mike Hutt. I want to thank in particular Sutha for his patient uh, support in setting up this event. I want to thank my publishers, Hearst, 
for uh, having faith in the book fundamentally. I think they did anyway. I hope they did. <laughs> um, and to all the organisers here for uh, doing for setting this event up. Last but not least, I wish to extend a personal note of thanks. I haven't had an opportunity to do this before in public to Eric and Vidal because not only have they been my constant interlocutors with the book, they've been tremendous supports. They, it was their idea, in a way, the project in the, in the first place. My only hope is that they feel it was worth it in the end. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, good to see you all. Uh, let me try to set out what I consider is the added value of this book. I mean, this is not the first book on what has happened in Sri Lanka, and nor for sure will it be the last. So what does this book add to what is already known? I mean, of uh, course, Mark has set out it's the uh, comprehensive uh, uh, story, I think very well told, uh, easy to read, not boring about what Norway did uh, in Sri Lanka. But for those of you who are not that interested in Norway, but more interested in Sri Lanka, which I think is most of you, uh, what, what is new? I, I will argue there are three main issues where it sheds more new light. Number one, uh, the, this is the book shedding a lot of new light about the workings of the Tamil Tigers. Because uh, remember, we were basically the only foreigners speaking to the Tamil Tigers. I mean, we and myself met Mr. Prabhakaran more often than any non-Tamil in the world. Prabhakaran spoke, I mean, I, I'm not aware that he spoke officially any, at any point to any Sinhalese. Uh, he once met with a Muslim delegation, uh, and his relationship to the international community was very limited. So except for Tamils, basically, we were the people speaking to Prabhakaran. Uh, so we know him better, I, I would claim, than nearly anyone else. And of course, meeting Mr. Balasingham here in London on basically a weekly basis, we got an insight into the workings of the LTT, which no one else can claim. That applies, for instance, to the fact that if a person had been killed by the LTT, the LTT would claim that, that well, they hadn't done it, it was the government who had done it to put the blame on them. Balasingham never ever did that, never ever. He would explain why the LTT had killed off that person. So we got an insight into it, which no one else uh, could uh, gather. And that's set out in, in this book. Uh, what happened, what is known about the killing of Rajiv Gandhi, what's kill known or, or, or later killings, why did the LTT end up as an organization which was so violent, and why were there no meaningful political initiative from the LTT side from 2006 to 2009, when the organization was pushed and pushed and pushed, you would think you would come up with some, something. I would claim that the death of Balasingham was the main reason for that. There was no one who could produce a political uh, initiative uh, from the LTT side. It also sets out our long conversations with the LTT in the uh, end phase of the war. To me, there is no doubt whatsoever that the government of Sri Lanka committed huge war crimes at the end of the war. Uh, indiscriminate shelling of Tamil civilians, killing of tens of, uh, tens of uh, thousands of people. There were a huge number of rapes, which is documented by Francis Harrison sitting, sitting down there. A vast number of uh, Tamils were handing themselves over to the government of Sri Lanka. There are witnesses to that. Uh, in all likelihood, all these are, are, are now dead. So there was huge war crimes on the government of Sri Lanka side. But there was also a clear offer to the LTT leadership to find an organized end to the war at a point where everyone knew the outcome of the war. There was no way whatsoever the LTD could win. They were moved into a weaker and weaker position. And Prabhakran could have saved the lives of all these civilians and the lives of all the LTT cadres if they had accepted an organized end to the war. And this is set out, uh, out in the book. Again, this cannot be used an as an excuse for war crimes. You are not allowed to shell, to shell uh, civilians, even if your opponents are stupid. But it's also part of the story. 
uh, that Prabhakaran uh, is responsible for this brutal end to the war while not accepting common sense, which would have been to end uh, it and fight in other, with other means in another day. Uh, all the LTT cadres would have been alive. They would be able to pick up the fight in, in other ways, like uh, many other groups uh, in the world. So I think the number one value of the book is setting out the relationship to the LTT and the knowledge of the LTT and very, very, very powerfully making the argument that you always need to engage. To me, a main problem of the peace process was that uh, the government of Sri Lanka tried to limit our, link, our relationship to Prabhakar and the LTT leadership, which was a complete mistake. The, uh, over time, the international community proscribed the LTT. Again, a major mistake. We should have done exactly the opposite. We should have opened up as many doors as possible. As many people as possible should have spoken to the LTT leadership. Should be that mean more people coming, and we should have tried the engagement. Because what people do not really understand is the character of the top leadership of the LTT. Uh, they were very isolated. Except for Mr. Balasingham, they had no real knowledge of the world. They had never been abroad. They were Balasingh and uh, Prabhakaran had been to India, but they had hardly been to the south of Sri Lanka, no, uh, nowhere, never everywhere else, and had no real understanding of the thinking in Washington or in <coughs> Delhi, or for that matter in Colombo. So it was an enormously isolated warlord sitting there, taking basically all the decisions, and they were not based on proper information, not based on good knowledge and insight. Uh, if there had been a much more uh, active relationship to him, uh, uh, some of these uh, mistakes could be avoided. And I still believe that there would be the potential that the international community and others could have convinced Prabhakram to accept federalism, and for that matter, and that would imply a resolution to the conflict. Second area where it provides, I think, new insight is the inner working of the government of Sri Lanka. However, of course, that's more open, so more people are aware of that. Uh, was set up by Mark, I mean, the, except for the LTT uh, leadership's uh, <coughs> belief in violence and, and uh, violent response to nearly every, every problem and the non-acceptance at the end of federalism. The other major problem of the peace process was the lack of unity on the Sinhalese side. Uh, the government uh, and the president came from two parties, but all through the process, the SLFP and the UMP fighting each other sometimes quite often fighting each other, at least in words and, and attitude, more than they were fighting the LTT. Uh, and that made it very, very difficult to get any, any real uh, offer to the Tamils, because if either side made an offer to the Tamils, the other side would oppose it, even if the offer you gave us the blue copy of what the other side said the, 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 the other months. So that, and there were any leader on the Sinhala side really making a substantial, serious offer to the Tamils would be stabbed in his or her back uh, by the other party on the other side by the Sinhalese. That was an enormous problem. And a number of opportunities were missed. Some were missed, as I said, by Prabhakaran, but others were missed by the government of Sri Lanka. It was an enormous opportunity after 2002. Yes, maybe uh, we, we should have waited until the SLFP and Shandik had been on board, maybe. But of course there was a momentum there which was not grabbed to really push the peace process forward on a kind of bipartisan uh, uh, way. In 2004, 2000, the first part of 2005, uh, with the, with the um, uh, tsunami, again there was a new opportunity. There was a kind of national unity which had ha hardly been in Sri Lanka. There was a willingness to find solution. But again it was missed and that opportunity was not missed by the LTT. That was missed. Uh, by the government of Sri Lanka at the time. They had opportunity, but they waited, 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 until it was too late. Momentum had uh, gone out of the process. It also sets out uh, the cynicism of Mahinda Rajapaksa and, uh, uh, and uh, the president of Sri Lanka. I mean, he was trying to portray himself as the great savior of, of the Sinhalese, but he was ready for any sort of dirty deal of any type if he could. Uh, if he could help his political fortunes. He tried to portray himself as a principled politician, uh, but the opposite was the case. I mean, he, for instance, told me uh, that uh, he was ready to give, uh, uh, give the North to Prabhakram. No problems, there would be no elections, he would just give it to Prabhakram. But with two conditions. Number one, it should be within the Sri Lankan state, not a separate state. And the other condition, 
was that there should be no protracted peace process because he thought a protracted peace process would undermine his support among the Singhalese. So he was opposed to a protracted peace process, but he was not supposed, uh, opposed to a backroom deal, a big bang where, you, uh, where Prabhupada was the chief minister of the, of the North uh, in such, such an exercise. It was absolutely contrary to what was his public, uh, public uh, statement. If you don't believe this, well, it's up to you whether you trust me or you trust Mahindra Rajapaksa. <laughs> because there were only, only two people in the room when this offer was, uh, was made. But, so that's, I, I can just leave it with you who, who, who you want to uh, trust on this matter. <coughs> Finally, the third era is the role of the international community. Uh, that was a, definitely a weakness of the process. I mean, Norway was selected as the facilitator exactly because we could not really bend anyone's arms. We were a small, and are a small, far away nation dominated by Christians who could do limited harm to, uh, to Sri Lanka. That's why we were acceptable to India, most importantly to me, because India was, was and is the main uh, foreign player in Sri Lanka. They could not accept any major power. They would not accept the United Kingdom, nor France, for sure not the United States or China, any major pl player. At the end, they accepted Norway because we were small. We kept them informed all the way. Uh, and we, we could not really harm Indian interest. Adding to that, we were also acceptable to the government of Sri Lanka and to the LTT for exactly those reasons. I mean, they contemplated others. For instance, the government of Sri Lanka proposed France as a uh, negotiator. Uh, then the LTT said, no, 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 you speak French, uh, meaning the president, and she had uh, spent her young days in, uh, in Paris during the student uh, revolution there. So they could not uh, they could not but France would never have been acceptable to India under and, and, and the circumstances, so that was, was an absolute, uh, absolute uh, non-starter. Non so we were accepted because we were a small player who could not really uh, uh, make difficulties for anyone. But that, of course, was also the weakness. We could not put any pressure on anyone. Uh, we could tell people that uh, we would expose their uh, lack of peace uh, <coughs> effort that we could not really put pressure. What we could do was to mobilize others to put pressure. That's of course why we spoke so, uh, on, basically on a monthly basis to India. I mean, we then myself went to Delhi all the time to inform the Indian leaders and uh, try to look into if they could put pressure. That's also why we, for, why we organized a group of the court chairs, being the United States, European Union, uh, uh, Japan, and Norway, because these other players could put some pressure. The difficulty with that was, of course, that Sri Lanka never came to the top political level, because there was always other. I mean, in Sri Lanka, people tend to believe that the world was rotating around Sri Lanka, that was the center of the universe. Unfortunately, it was not. There was, from the, if you were in Washington uh, or any other capital, uh, there were always so many other crises. There were always Iraq or Afghanistan or the domestic issues, or the re-election, or whatever, or the economic problems, was always another crisis. So Sri Lanka didn't really get to the attention of those who could really put pressure. The Americans were helpful throughout, India was helpful throughout, uh, but still uh, they were helpful, but not really using their leverage to put pressure on the government, where they could have they had less leverage on the Tigers, but they could have, been spent, uh, they could have done, done more to put pressure on the government. Unfortunately, we were not able to pull that off. And if you summarize why at the end the peace process did not succeed, why long it looked very pro um, promising, and still I believe that peace could have been found through negotiated means, these were the three reasons. The lack of vision of the LTT leadership, meaning Prabhakaram, is at the end belief that every issue had a violent response and that federalism, he would, while he accepted federalism, he still couldn't embrace it and postponed it and postponed it to a point where it could not be achieved. Secondly, the lack of unity of the Sri Lankan uh, Singhalese parties and their uh, infighting. And thirdly, our lack of ability to really mobilize the international community to put pressure uh, on the parties. Thank you. Mr. Hogerson. Good evening. Um, 
Mark started or ended by asking whether we thought it was worth it. And um, obviously that question could pertain to the exercise of the book or the exercise of the peace process. I think both were worth it. Uh, the book, because it, it just had to be done. Um, giving uh, Mark, who among the several virtues mentioned, uh, one was left unmentioned, the fact that he, as a resident in Sweden, was able to read Norwegian files, which was useful in the process of uh, writing the book. Um, the fact that he could go through it all, um, make interviews, and present not from a I mean, from a Norwegian perspective, reflected through his fairly unbiased eyes, um, a process from the very beginning to the very end. I think it had to be done, and it's very good that it has been done. The peace process also had to be done. It had to be tried, because um, you have to try. Peace has to be tried. And when we uh, engaged as a third party, um, that comes with several limitations. And one limitation is already mentioned by the phrase third party. There are two other parties, there are two main parties. And the uh, ultimate responsibility rests with those parties, whether you call them first or second parties or whether you call them the two first parties, because as a mediator or facilitator, you need to treat them uh, in a similar way. We were obviously very mindful of the fact that lack of bipartisanship had always been the big uh, impediment on the government side in Sri Lanka, but it wasn't up to Norway to resolve uh, that issue. The LTTE came across as obviously much more of a monolithic uh, structure, but we also saw how the Karuna breakaway made the peace process management more complicated on that side too. Um, there are at times also divisions within the third party, different opinions, but uh, always resolved by peaceful means. Uh, the book also sheds some light on the issue, and I can talk about it because I wasn't involved, issues between Eric and uh, former foreign minister uh, Torbjörn Jagland when it comes to dealing with the process and how one of the parties uh, tried to play with the third party role. So, um, but, but ultimately, the third party can't carry uh, the major responsibility, and that was something we were very mindful of in the process. I clearly agree with what Eric said about the international context and what Mark said about the international context. Um, the way the post 9 11 world impacted on this process um, was a challenge. The way, particularly when the tsunami, devastating as it was, provided an opportunity for restarting the peace process because it had such a profound effect on both sides and not least on the LTT side. Um, the international community wasn't able to engage with the North and the East. Uh, I think that's where the final curtain was drawn in many ways on the LTT side. And the way uh, the international community was effectively shut out at the end of the war um, reflects not uh, the post-9-11 world, but maybe what Farid Zakaria called the post-American world, how what was seen <coughs> by many as the international community as meaning the West was shut out um, in a very dramatic way, uh, making any efforts uh, diplomatically at the end of the war very difficult. But again, the national situation is what uh, matters the most. And this is also a story of uh, people that put down a lot of effort and people that were willing to make great sacrifices for peace. This is not the story of the war. There are always war heroes in wars, and there are contests. Con the, the, who are war heroes is a contested issue. But this is a story about peace heroes, and in my view, uh, peace heroes are 
often in a more challenging and difficult situation than war heroes. It's, uh, it's easier to become a war hero in some ways than a peace hero, because if you're a peace hero, you need to challenge your own constituency. You need to make sacrifices. A war hero rallies his or her, her own uh, constituency. And um, I think that's important to keep in mind. Ranil Vikramasinghe, as prime minister, was willing to make great sacrifices for peace. Um, Ch Chandrika, as well, was uh, willing to make sacrifices when she started this process. Uh, but quite often, things came in the way of going all the way. Um, on the LTT side, um, Anton Balasingam was clearly with his foresight and wisdom, a man who was willing to make sacrifices for peace and challenging his constituency, like Raniel was willing on his side. And I think this is interesting also in the current context. Uh, Raniel is back as prime minister, and uh, there is an end to the violent conflict, but that is not an end to all conflict and tension and deeper rooted issues in Sri Lankan society. And therefore, uh, winning the peace, winning uh, the effort of addressing uh, issues that are still there uh, to build a lasting and inclusive peace is still <coughs> very much a challenge for the people of Sri Lanka and the politicians of Sri Lanka. And uh, I uh, think it's uh, an interesting thing to note that Ranil Vikramasinghe, who was willing on the other end of the book, at the early end of the book, to make sacrifices, is back as prime minister, and let's hope that he will be a successful uh, peace hero as he set out to be 10, 15 years ago. Thank you. Our final speaker is uh, Dr. Sutaharan Nadaraja, our very own. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you to Mark and Eric and Vida and Michael for inviting me to make some comments on this book. Um, it's a big book. Uh, there's lots in it. it. covers a long period. Um, and I've read it um, with a view to a story, right? And that's exactly what I felt as I went through it. I'm glad Mark used that term. Um, I thought it might be disparaging if I said that. Um, essentially, he gives an account. It's an account of Sri Lanka that starts um, around 81, accelerates to the start of the peace process, and then follows it through uh, in careful steps all the way through. Uh, to the end of the peace process, in around 2006, through the resumption of war, the end of the war, and then ends. Um, and as a story, um, it's told very clearly through a Norwegian perspective. And that's in great part because his two key contributors, the, two, the, the, the people whose perspectives are most represented, are Eric and Vidal. And in that way, it's a valuable book because for many of the events that we know about, many of the moments we know about, you get an insight into precisely how the Norwegians as a whole, and occasionally Eric and Vidal separately, understood that. Along with a whole bunch of other diplomats, other international voices, and some... Um, uh, non-Norwegian voices. So in that sense, it should be read. And I think the book is uh, uh, particularly valuable because of the number of comment boxes that, in their own words, the diplomats are able to say what they think. However, there's always a however. As with any story, it has to start somewhere, it has to choose what it includes, and it has to choose what it leaves out. This is not a criticism, it's just an observation. If you read this book, you will get a perspective on Sri Lanka, right? That's implicit, it's not explicit, because the purpose of the book is to work through Norwegian diplomacy, and the focus is entirely at a very high level. Uh, it's about interactions with uh, Mr. Valasinghe, Mr. Prabharan, Mr. Vikramasinghe, with Chandrika, and so on. And it's effectively track one. What you don't get is a sense of what is Sri Lanka. Any account of a peace process must start with an account of the conflict. And in this case, you have to work out what is the explanation of the conflict from the peace process. In my view, that's the only weakness, but it's an important one. Because if you read it, you'll get a sense of a very powerful armed organization and a strong but divided 
leadership battling it out with a Norwegian squad in the middle. To some extent, that's true. But as Eric very clearly observed, when one government makes a peace move, whatever that move is, saying hello, then the other party, the opposition party, will stab them in the back. That's a, it's an observation, but it's a very profound statement. Why is this possible? In my view, the thing that's often left out is the force in Sri Lanka of singular Buddhist nationalism as a mainstream legitimizing context. Right? That's not possible to understand why, even as they battle each other, blaming the Norwegians or blaming the LTT has become the way to gain popular legitimacy. Right? And in particular, I'm just going to say the, the, the key is where the conflict starts in the book. It starts in 81, and it starts primarily with the run-up to the start of the war and the pogrom in 1983. And in that sense, key issues like the demand for Tamilulam, etc., become tied up with the LTT. Now, it's fine because it's an account of the peace process. But you don't really understand why, before 81, this had become a mainstream Tamil popular demand. And you also don't understand why is it that a community that started with federalism, went to Tamilulam, was then offered federalism, and then eventually was ratcheted back. Now, the book is exhaustive in working through a series of failures. P. Tom's, the uh, post-tsunami, um, aid sharing mechanisms, the failures around specific micro details of the peace process. And, and the detail <coughs> is invaluable. But I would suggest, as you read it, you should think about the broader context. Thank you. Okay. I, I mean, I'll, <clears throat> okay. Thanks. I mean, I, I just, I, I think I'll, I'll just make two observations. I mean, firstly, thanks to everyone for their comments. Um, it's, I think Sutha is actually absolutely right on, on one thing, which is that, I mean, the way he defined the focus of the book and my intentions, is absolutely correct. I mean, I, you know, if you tell a story, you have to decide. What is the story? What's the plot line? Who are the characters? And that's a decision you make, and by definition, it maybe means that some of the characters are left out, or the plot line overemphasizes some things and de-emphasizes others from some, some people's perspective. And that kind of leads me to my second thing. I, mean, I think what Sutha, if I hear Sutha correctly, um, his, his sort of criticism or his implicit, I mean, the, the weakness he identifies is that I, he feels I haven't given sufficient contextual analysis to how we got to conflict in Sri Lanka, and that would possibly take us back to the post-independence period and to the 50s and the non-violence movement of the early 60s and, and the federal demands of some of the mainstream Tamil parties and so on and so forth. Now... I mean, in one, I suppose my response at one level is yes, of course I could. Have, I mean, I could have done that. It's just that you know this is already quite a big book, <laughs> <laughs> and it's about a third shorter than the one that I wrote originally. And I, I, I just didn't feel that it was um, really added value to get too much into the analysis of the roots co and causes of the conflict. Those are issues that are well addressed elsewhere. Um, I felt that the Norwegian story was the one to tell. But, I mean, all that said, I think the points he's making are absolutely, I mean, they're valid. We do need to understand that bigger picture. Um, maybe just one other comment. I, um, just thinking about what Eric was saying, I mean, again, I mean, I'm very familiar, with, you know, one of the things about spending a long time working on a book and interviewing people is you get to know your interlocutor's thinking perhaps even better than they themselves <laughs> realize. Um, so what I heard Eric saying there was, was absolutely um, consistent with the things that we've discussed in the past. I just wonder, though, whether this emphasis that he placed, his sort of third point about the, the weaknesses of the Norwegian position, the lack of a big stick, um, or the lack of a kind of power base. I mean, he's not the only one to say that, but... I mean, given that, as he himself said, you know, it was a definitional kind of criteria of Norwegian engagement, that they didn't have that. I mean, the, for example, Kadrigama, uh, Laxman Kadrigama, the, the, the 
um, foreign minister who was assassinated in 2005. I mean, you know, people like him were so crystal clear that given, our, given the desire to defend national sovereignty, maintain sovereignty, there was absolutely no way in which the Sri Lankan government was going to accept in a third party who had anything more than a facilitation. I mean, even the language, you know, they weren't allowed to be called mediators, they had to be called facilitators, you know, which by definition, I mean, there's a crucial difference there. You know, I think um, maybe the question I turn around, Eric, is well, maybe the maybe maybe the Norwegians weren't didn't have the big stick. But the question is, could anybody have had it, and would it have made a difference even if they'd had it? Because if they had, I'm not sure the Sri Lankan authorities would have allowed them in. I don't know. It's a difficult one, but it's just a question. Thanks. Well, thank you very much to to all members of the panel for um, very very concise and very pertinent uh, comments and observations. Um, I think this is the stage of the evening where we now open it up to the floor for, um, for questions. May I ask you, when you're asking a question, to <coughs> identify yourself um, and keep your questions and comments brief, <coughs> brief if, you, if you can, um, and perhaps if you wish to address them to a specific member of the panel, you could um, just let us know who that would be. So who would like to go first? Please. Yes, um, there's a roving mic somewhere. Oh, there's a microphone around somewhere. Just the microphone, if you could. Yeah. Well, maybe if you could make yourself heard whilst we look for the mic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My name. Yep. Hello, my name is Chris Langdon from Reconciliation Through Film. Two questions. One for our Norwegian guests. What have been the lessons you've learned from the process in Sri Lanka for the other peacemaking initiatives you have? I mean, for example, from the unit supporting uh, the Sri Lankan process under people like the late Thomas Stangeland, you set up a peace and reconciliation unit. How have you, uh, uh, how have you developed the thinking from what you've, because you were clearly were very keen to learn from the, from the failures in Sri Lanka, how has that informed your peacemaking in other situations? And I know you've mentioned the question of Ranil now being back in power. Now also there is a reconciliation commission in Sri Lanka run by you no know, less a person than CBK. Maybe a question for Sutha. How do you see now we have two of the faces who we've been discussing, both now back, um, both of them committed to reconciliation in, on paper, and of course obviously there's now a new face of the, of the president. How do you see that process of reconciliation playing out, given the actors have a long track record in history. Thank you. Okay, so that's, that's, that's two questions. One for our, either of our Norwegian guests who would like to respond. Obviously, every conflict is separate. I mean, you can learn some general lessons and you, that can inform what you do in other uh, theaters. But at the end, every conflict has its separate roots. I think the three main lessons we learned in Sri Lanka, I mean, there are many, I mean, this book is rich, so there are also a huge number of kind of second layer uh, lessons learned about uh, how sh maybe should Norway have done more on information, should we have had a bigger team and all these kind of issues, but there are second layers. I mean, the three main uh, issues, number one was there should have been a lot more engagement with Delta T. Uh, the, we should have avoided the situation where the government of Sri Lanka made an engagement with the LTT, a reward for good behavior. When the LTT behaved well according to their view, then, well, fine, if everyone goes there. If the LTT do not behave well, I mean, then we, we, we shut the channels. We should learn from this. You need to speak to people. Remember that this was at the time of the completely ridiculous, idiotic Bush doctrine that you should not speak to, to terrorists. Uh, they didn't want to speak to the Taliban when Taliban was weak. Now everyone wants to speak to the Taliban. Now Taliban is much stronger. Everyone says we need to speak to them. Uh, and that complete failure of the idea that you should not speak to so-called terrorists, that was, uh, th though they all wanted us to do it, Many more should have done that. Should we have open channel, uh, channels in, in a completely other way? And we should have really tried to impress upon Prabhakaran what are the international views. I mean, he made one step after the other, which were, to me, absolutely counterproductive. I mean, he said that key to the LTT is that they are not prescribed. Well, 
if they don't want to be prescribed, why do you make actions which uh, at the end will doom you to be prescribed? So also set out in the book, at the end it was just Sweden who opposed uh, prescription of the LTT, I still recall Jan Eliasson, who is now the vice, uh, vice Secretary General of the United Nations. He called me from the EU meeting saying that, well, I'm now the last remaining only foreign minister opposing prescription of the LTT. I, I can't do it alone when no one else supports me. And Prabhakaran had made all the steps which at the end was doomed to happen. Uh, but if many more people have uh, related to him, maybe, and I, I think that that could be avoided. Secondly, we should have done a lot more to put pressure on the two main forces in Sri Lanka to come together. True, Norway could hardly do that. But we should have insisted a lot more that Indians should do it. They were the only who really could put that pressure on, on the... On the on the president and the prime minister, on the SLFP and the UMP, and uh, they didn't want to do it, they didn't want to be involved in Indian politics, but at the end that, that was a failure. And thirdly, uh, as we have already touched upon, uh, a stronger international component. Maybe Norway should have also ele elevated it on our side, uh, though Vida and myself may be nice guys uh, and have fine titles. Uh, but, of course, maybe if we had involved the Prime Minister and the top players on the Norwegian government more, they may have been able to speak at a higher level in the United States and in the other places, so that we could have done more to bring the international community together. But it was not easy, because Sri Lanka was never at the top of anyone's agenda. Remember that the peak of this was exactly at the same time as the war in Iraq, at the, uh, at the early phases of the Afghanistan uh, <coughs> conflict with Western uh, involvement and a huge number of other conflicts which were much higher on the agenda in key capitals. So we did a lot to try to attract attention, but maybe we could have done more. Thank you. Um, Sutta, there's a question for you. And yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm not in, in a disagreement with, with uh, Sutta on, on the role of Buddhist nationalism in, in Sri Lanka, that's of course at the core of the problem. Uh, but this is not a book about all aspects of uh, Sri Lankan politics and history, it's a book about the this phase of the peace process, and that's why that's not really uh, covered, except being, of course, very important background music, for sure. Yeah, well, I had a slightly that's different suit. perspective. Okay. Uh, if you look at the period from the moment the Norwegian initiative was made public around 2000, from that time on, and certainly after it became a formal process, it was a period of incessant protest. Right. It was a period of mobilization by the Buddhist monks. It was a uh, mobilization by uh, relatively um, small but rapidly growing single and nationalist forces like the National Movement Against Terrorism, uh, Singular Rumaya, who eventually, within by 2004, on the one hand, the JVP secured power with an alliance with the government, and then on the other hand, the JHU took a chunk out of the UNP's vote base and also came to power. It's worth noting the JHU is still in power. So in the sense of, it's a crucial moment, that, uh, although we, the, the book quite rightly focuses on the interactions amongst uh, high level players, the actual, the fabric of Sri Lanka transformed significantly in those five to 10 years. On the one hand, you had um, a kind of affirmation of mainstream affirmation of singular nationalism. And on the other hand, on the other side, there was again, after a, uh, a long time, popular protest based on Tamil nationalist principles. Now, the book does occasionally refer to the Pongo Tamil movement and so on, and as then, um, it's kind of dismissed as uh, sort of LTT orchestrated. On the other hand, once the LTT is gone, we still have popular mobilization where it's permitted, where space permits it, explicitly on the basis of homeland nation uh, self-determination. The TNA's election victories, its election campaigning is based entirely on this. So what I'm actually saying is that it's not I'm not saying that it needs to be part of the book, but I'm saying that if you don't see that and you read this um, um, at a high level, you can't understand why actors are doing the things they do. Um, and with regards to, to Ranul uh, Vikramasinghe being prime minister then and Chandrika Kumaratunga being president, at that time, for, uh, to explain his inability to make uh, steps, Ranul was always concerned that Chandrika would blow the peace process up. And to some extent, you could, you could say he was right. 
On the other hand, now that uh, Surusena is president, allied to, to Vikramasinghe, his explanation for not making moves is the opposition, Rajapaksa, will blow things up. So in some senses, the idea of the well-meaning but hapless Ranil Vikramasinghe is a persistent story. Now, he may be well-meaning, he may not, but there is a question. If, if, if whilst a prime minister, without a helpful president, he could not move forward, now, with a helpful president, can he move forward? My, question, my suggestion is that in the next six to 18 months, we'll be very clear how committed he is to the principles he espouses. And I'll just add one more comment about Ranul's and Chandrika's era. Um, the book is very clear on why the, book, the peace process starts. There's a chapter titled 2000, and the key points of that chapter are, one, the destruction of the Sri Lankan military's offensive capability, comprehensive destruction on the one hand, and the weakening of the Sri Lankan economy, the collapse of the Sri Lankan economy um, on the other. And, and uh, the context uh, for that is that the peace process starts because Sri Lanka does not, is not able to prosecute the war and the economy is in crisis. Within the first year of the Norwegian <coughs> peace process, um, both those things got fixed. First of all, the inflow of international aid changed the context where the Sri Lankan economy started to revive. And secondly, as uh, Brian Bloggett has um, detailed in his book on the Sri Lankan military, in 2002, in 2002, between the ceasefire and the start of negotiations, the Sri Lankan Navy doubled in size, the Sri Lankan Air Force doubled in size, the Sri Lankan Air Force's uh, attack gunships doubled in number, and the Army's artillery doubled in number, all within the first six months. The Army added 30,000 soldiers. So although the context as, as then uh, was very much about what military advantage one side or other was trying to secure through the negotiations, in fact, the table had already shifted decisively. Now, those are the kinds of contexts I'm saying. It does not take away from the analysis presented here. The analysis is very much representative of how things were talked about and understood. But if you're looking at the structural problems underlying this peace process, there's much more than the interactions between key and significant figures. Those were two very full answers. Thank you very much. Um, um, I think there was a hand up here. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Rajesh Venugopal from the London School of Economics. Uh, this is a book on Norway's role in, in this ceasefire period, Norwegian mediation. And I wanted to ask um, you how, Mark, you address this issue, particularly given the fact that two of the leading um, people involved in Norway's side were close collaborators in the book. And to some extent, it leads to the inevitable question as to how you maintained a certain critical distance from this and were able to work objectively because you know, the objects that, that about whom you're writing about are here defending the book and expanding on it and talking about it. So I wonder how we should approach the book. Uh, is, should we see it as Norway's official version of what happened or should we see it as sort of your critical review of the literature and of the subjects that you have written about? I think they, the, um, these guys want that microphone. <laughs> OK. Um, well, you know, uh, I suppose my initial temptation is to say, well, you just view it the way you want to view it, really. But, um, but if you ask me what I think, or what I hope, is that, yes, it absolutely is a critical account. I mean, let's be clear here. Vidar and Eric, and indeed a number of other Norwegians, were important interviewees, I mean, sources for me. Um, but I'm a journalist by background. Uh, I like to think, at least, that I know about the difference between um, reporting and hagiography. <laughs> um, so uh, I've always I've reported a lot of what they had to say. Um, where I questioned it, I think I've indicated that, and where I thought they were wrong, which I did think sometimes, or I disagreed, um, I've certainly done that as well, and I, I think I hope at least Eric particularly would be the first to uh, agree <laughs> that uh, our discussions have not all been plain sailing uh, in terms of our analysis of problems and situations. But I mean, you know, fundamentally, of course, there's an issue. I mean, with you, if you have sources who are part of, who are one of the parties, I mean, 
that they're primary, they're privileged sources. Um, but that said, I, I just would go back to the thing of which I said in the introduction about telling a story. I have tried to tell a story, and that means talking to the actors in the story. Um, and I think it's really up to you to judge whether you think at the end what comes through is a kind of credibly independent or uh, you know, objective account of the story, like which sets out the facts but also interprets them and certainly doesn't just give them privileged, uncritical treatment. Um, the feedback I've had from people who have looked at it is they feel I've done that, but I'm very open to people telling me they think I've, I mean, at least discussing, <laughs> you know, whether they feel I've done that. Thanks. Thank you. Did you want to add it? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I, um, needless to say, I share Mark's uh, view on this, but I'd like to add that um, pertaining to Sutha's perspective, since this is not a book about the conflict, it's not about the underlying causes of the conflict, it's not about the dynamics of the conflict throughout the peace process, but it's about the peace process. Obviously, it will give Norway and the Norwegian perspective way more significance as an account than would an account of the conflict because Norway is not a part, wasn't a party to the conflict. But we were very much an actor in the peace process. Um, so if you want to look at this as an account of the conflict and with a view on the conflict, you'll not find this uh, a credible objective account. It's an objective account of a peace process very much seen from the facilitator's uh, perspective um, as a facilitator of a peace process. Thank you. Um, yes, just here, please. Gentlemen, yes, you, yes, please. Thank you. My name's Jonathan Steele. I'm a journalist. I, I wanted to ask Eric Solheim a very intriguing point you raised in your introduction. I mean, you were very clear that war crimes were committed at the final phase of the war and the whole thing was total defeat of the LTTE. But you also seem to indicate that there was a point when if the LTT had made a sensible proposal, there could have been a sort of political outcome that would have avoided the killing of the last few months. I mean, at what stage could that have been possible? Because surely once the Sri Lankan army started in autumn 2008, to advance northwards, they would never have accepted anything less than unconditional surrender, surely. I mean, what, what was the <coughs> proposal that you think could have been put forward by Prabhakarin at that stage that would have been acceptable to Rajapaksa? Thank you. To me, it's absolutely clear that, I mean, up, up to about the, uh, the summer of 2008, no one thought that at the end the war could be won by either side. I mean, Changing, I mean, in, we all, always, I mean, Norway, of course, did not have particularly specific intelligence in Sri Lanka, so we, re, we, we relied, uh, relied a lot upon intelligence provided by others and took the view that India is by far the nation which is most informed about what's happening in Sri Lanka and understand it best. So, of course, we took Indian views very seriously. Up to about August 2008, the Indians always said this war cannot be won. Uh, and there can only be a negotiated peace. But uh, from around August 2008, Narayanan, then the National Security Advisor, told me, no, maybe I was wrong. Maybe the government can win a military victory. And of course, from that point, uh, the LTT was moved into a smaller and smaller perimeter. They lost Kilinochi, uh, they, uh, they lost, which was the kind of the LTT capital, and they, uh, the area was shrinking and shrinking. Uh, in January 2009, we made a so-called co-chair statement from which we, Norwegian, initiated. It's also well covered in the book, where we said, we know the outcome of the war. There is no way the LTT can win. It's just cl it's clear uh, that the government has won. We didn't put it in exactly these words, but that was, the, that, was the, uh, that was the intent. So let's find an organized end to the war. The offer was very clear. Uh, there will be uh, some sort of there will be ships. LTT cadres would, would hand themselves over to India, to the United States, to the United Nations, to the ICRC. Uh, basically, whatever system they would want to accept, 
and every cadre handing himself or herself over, name uh, will be registered, photos will be taken, uh, and there will be an amnesty for all except the absolute top leadership, basically Prabhakar and Potoaman, the chief of uh, intelligence uh, of the LTT. Uh, this could easily be been organized. Of course, it's possible to kill someone after you have handed yourself over. Obviously, it's possible. But it's much more difficult to kill anyone who has handed himself over to the ICRC with photos taken, registered, etc. Uh, so to me, it was very clear. And true, you're right. I mean, the government of Sri Lanka wouldn't have wanted this. They wanted a full, uh, a full uh, victory. But they would have had no choice but to, to accept this. Because if the LTT had accepted this, the Indians and the Americans and others would have told them very, very clearly, here you have a chance to end the war with tens of thousands of lives spared, and uh, uh, please do it. Uh, so they would have had no option but to accept at that point. But this stopped because Prabhakaran did not want this. We were calling, we were speaking to the LTT by telephone to the Vanne, but more importantly to KP, which was then the kind of foreign minister of the LTT, previously the chief weapons purchaser of the LTT, uh, and conveying this message. And we were told, I mean, I offered to go there, but more importantly, people like Ban Ki-moon offered to go there, and the top level, I mean, foreign ministers, there would be an, no problem to send anyone there to discuss this matter with Prabhakaran. But we got the reply, please come, but we will meet with Mr. Nadesan, who was the head of the, of the political wing of the LTT. And of course, with Nadesan, you could not make this kind of deal, only with Prabhakaran. So I, I personally, said, no doubt, there was a way. It would have been humiliating, for sure, for the LTT, but it would have saved the lives of all these people, and they would have been able to fight with other means another day. Can I, Michael, can I just... Please, 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 sorry, please. just a quick word. I mean, I, it's only to back up something Eric said. I mean, I was particularly struck by this when researching the book and writing it, is that th this process that Eric just described of the proposal from the co-chairs for a so-called organised surrender, I mean, which was conveyed then to the LTE leadership by, from among, amongst other things, Tore Hatram, the then Norwegian ambassador in Colombo. I mean, it's kind of almost when you read it, it's agonising. You know, the, the offer, the proposal is on the table. It's got the backing of the co-chairs. No question, as Eric said, that the government, especially Gotabaya Rajapaksa, absolutely not what they wanted, absolutely not what they had in mind. But at the same time, no way they could have refused it if the LTT had agreed. But, of course, what happens is basically silence. I mean, apart from the suggestion of meeting with Nadesan, you know, it's just crystal clear that the message from Babaka, and to the extent there was a message, was we're not going down that path. And, and the consequence, as Eric said, is that thousands and thousands of lives that could have been saved were lost. As late as April 2009, one month before the final end of the war, KP, he was then in Malaysia. We had, sent, I mean, she, we had agreed that he, he would come to Oslo and we would, we would uh, discuss this, uh, this uh, organized end. We had even sent Norwegian security people to Kuala Lumpur to pick him up. But at the at very last moment, Prabhakaran said, no, we shouldn't go. Um, towards the back in the middle, please. My name is uh, Tana International Live Channel. Um, thanks for Mark uh, bringing this book out. Uh, obviously, all of you just mentioned that read this as a story, and we're looking forward to it. Um, former British Prime Minister uh, Tony Blair uh, apologised for taking part in the Iraq War. Would Honourable former Minister uh, Eric Solem? would apologize for facilitating Sri Lankan government for massacring 80,000 Tamils in the north and east within two weeks. And uh, Tony Blair's excuse were uh, wrong, intelligent. And if you do think that you should apologize, and what would be your excuse, please? Do you wish to respond to that? <coughs> Uh, I, I think I have very clearly set out all we did to uh, put an end to this war. Uh, at the uh, last moments, we have no leverage with the government of Sri Lanka. We did our utmost with the international community to put pressure on them to, to stop the way uh, the war was handled. 
Uh, what we did have was we were the people really relating to the Tamil Tigers because at, the, at that time no one else was doing that. Uh, and we uh, did our utmost to convince Prabhakram to organize an end to the war. He refused. We did not refuse. He refused. Indians did not refuse. Americans did not refuse. He refused. So we should put the blame where the blame should be put. And that's squarely in two places. It is with Mr. Rajapaksa, the president of Sri Lanka, and his brother Gotabaya Rajapaksa. And it is with Mr. Prabhakram. Thank you for that very clear reply. Um, lady in the yellow top. Thank you. Milica Pesic, Media Diversity Institute, London. Um, whether Tony Blair apologized or not, it seems uh, <laughs> depends which inform a source of information we, we mm -hmm. followed, yes. because Evening Standard said one thing, BBC the other. But my question is actually related to journalism and to media. Usually, journalists follow more conflict to link to war, war heroes and, and peace heroes because it seems like visually war is more appealing and attractive. How did you see the role of media? Um, did they cover the peace um, process? How did they cover it? Did you see the differences between different sides in uh, uh, reporting on the peace process? Is, this is a question to the author? Or? I think, well, well, Mark was a journalist, he said, and then the, the, the two gentlemen who, who ran the, the process, probably all three paid attention to what uh, okay. media were doing. Mark, well, I mean, Mark you're uh, a journalist, apparently. Well, apparently, yes, Penny. Um, well, I, I'm going to say something brief, because I'd like to hand it over the question, a response to Eric and Vidal, because they were there and they really saw how the, the Lankan and Tamil media were, were reporting. For example, from, it's, a, it's, it's a fascinating thing, how the peace talks were reported in, in the media. I just want to only put in one thing, which is that um, a, a, an observation, a comment that one Sri Lankan a journalist made, which is reported or rec recorded in the book, uh, uh, Shimali Senayake, who, who, who covered you know, the peace talks quite a lot, including for the New York Times. And she said that one of the issues she saw, and this is speaking as a, a, a Sri Lankan herself, um, but uh, writing for English language media, was that there were numbers of uh, domestic journalists who would turn up for press conferences with the Norwegians and would feel embarrassed about the fact that they didn't really speak English and thus wouldn't put a question because they didn't, you know, translate it and so on. And then they would rely on other sources, sort of third-hand accounts of the, of the talks and end up with reporting on the talks, which was actually very skewed. My point being this, that I think there was a lot that got literally lost in translation in Sri Lanka. There was a lot where what the Norwegians, for example, said and what they meant simply didn't reach a domestic audience. Not for any reason of ill will or, or misintention, but simply because of the language and cultural gap. And I think the lesson for that, and this is relevant for other conflict contexts, is that, and it's something that the Norwegians themselves, and you'll see it in the book, you know, I think reflect on quite a lot, is that there probably, um, there should have been and probably could have been a much bigger effort on the Norwegian side um, to really ensure that their message or messages got out to ordinary Sri Lankans, but on both sides of the ethnic divide, just to make sure that information about, in fact, for example, with the peace talks in Oslo in November 2002, when the so-called Oslo Declaration um, was tabled, you know, which was talking about envisaging discussions on a future federal solution, to the ethnic divide or the, the political settlement could be based on that. I'm really not sure that that message got through to most ordinary Sri Lankans. I mean, literally just what in fact was being proposed. And yet that's obviously critical. Without that information, how can you build a peace constituency within the country? So that's a refresher. But Eric, do you want to add? Uh, I can say a few words about Sri Lankan journalism and then you can uh, maybe bring the international perspective because the lack of real global coverage of the war when in the, at the end was, of course, a main factor for the lack of international engagement. I mean, there was no TV channel really covering the suffering of the people. You didn't see Tamil mothers screaming on CNN or BBC. 
uh, in, in the last phase of the war. You didn't see the people who have been bombed to hell. You didn't see them. You didn't see the bodies. You didn't see the war. That uh, was one of the reasons why there was limited international uh, action at them. But if we, if we move on to Sri Lankan journalism, uh, unfortunately, that uh, has been weak. Uh, it has been very often <coughs> negative. I mean, uh, referring to what also Soda said, I mean, uh, portraying the other group as, uh, as negative, uh, inventing stories, no check of facts. You can invent any sort of story. And of course, uh, close uh, uh, to the end of the war, journalists were absolutely subdued. Uh, think, think of the fact that Asanta Vikramatunge, one of the best, most well-known journalists and editors in Sri Lanka, was killed in broad daylight in the main street of Colombo at 10 o'clock in the morning, and no one was no investigation into that murder. It would be parallel to if the editor of Times or The Guardian had been killed uh, at Oxford Street in London in the middle of the day with a lot of businesses around, and no effort whatsoever had been put up to, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, investigate the case. Uh, that was, of course, enormously, it was an extreme event, absolutely bloody, very horrible, but it also sends a very, 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 very potent message. Uh, if you can kill Asanta Vikramatunge, for sure you can kill any not well-known Tamil or Sinhalese journalist who do not behave. Um, I think it's Francis. Sorry. Maybe you should say, want to say a few for some international media. I think on, on, okay, yeah. you referred to it slightly, but the, the way uh, journalism is evolving um, seems to mean that there are fewer uh, correspondents in fewer places. And uh, in our experience, when it comes to the international media, those with an in-country presence, or at least the capacity to spend considerable amounts of time in the country, were obviously the ones doing the best and well-informed reporting. And I think that's essential in order to, as Eric said, to mobilize international attention, both through the peace process and through, um, at least through, through the war. The absence of reporting towards the end was mind-boggling in many ways. Otherwise, journalists with less knowledge of the process tended to sort of have two perspectives. Either is there a breakdown in the process or is there a breakthrough in the process? And if things couldn't be categorized in either of those ways, there wouldn't be so much interest in reporting anything. Uh, Francis Harrison. Um, I'd like to bring the discussion forward to what's going on at the moment, and we've just had the UN report in, on Sri Lanka, and um, that report and Prince Aid himself were very articulate about the nature of the systematic crimes that occurred and are still occurring in Sri Lanka. Um, and he talks about, uh, the High Commissioner talks about system crimes, <coughs> and yet we've had remarks from the government, from the Foreign Minister of Sri Lanka, talking basically about a few individual officers who may have been involved in you know, specific incidents, and that's clearly echoed in the recent uh, Disappearances Commission, the Paranagama report. So it's the rotten apple theory, if you like. And yet, on the other hand, we have an international investigation that's basically pointed to very widespread, systematic, very serious problems with the Sri Lankan security forces that address, that affect not just Tamils, but everybody else in Sri Lanka. Um, I want to ask Vida Helgesen, since he's part of the Norwegian government still, um, what kind of approach Norway will take now to making sure that those, those systematic crimes of the past and ongoing ones will be addressed by the international community and specifically by your government? Because I think there's a kind of concern amongst many of the victims that I meet that um, the international community, specifically Norway, Switzerland, South Africa and the United States, are very supportive of this new government and therefore not critical enough about the issues regarding, pertaining to human rights. And you mentioned that I, I document rape and se um, sexual violence allegations. I mean, we've now, as a group, documented 15 cases that have occurred in 2015 after the elections in January, and including also cases that occurred after the August parliamentary elections. So the ongoing violations are still pretty extensive. These are people who've managed to flee abroad. 
and got as far as Europe and obviously represent the tip of some sort of iceberg of actually what's going on in Sri Lanka. The ongoing violations are still really very disturbing indeed and we're concerned that the international community doesn't speak loudly enough on those issues. That's for you, Vera. I think exactly because I'm currently a minister in the Norwegian government, but also um, a key source of this uh, book, and uh, this is an event about this book, I will refrain from commenting on the actual uh, situation because uh, um, the... Um, current portfolio I have doesn't cover these issues and um, we have a, a government position and we uh, and I have my personal views that, that's but here I'm as a representative of uh, my past rather than my present. Eric you were indicating you'd like to say? Yeah I, I cannot speak on behalf of a government uh, which I didn't didn't vote for. <laughs> you didn't. I thought we had an agreement. <laughs> that which I have very good relations to. Uh, but I can speak my, my view uh, on, this, on this matter. I mean, to me, there is absolutely no doubt about the big picture. The big picture we know, there was indiscriminate shelling of a very, very small perimeter, uh, densely populated by Tamil civilians, with enormous casualties. In all likelihood, it was not, even, not just that, it was even deliberate targeting of civilian targets like hospitals. I mean, there are very, very, very strong indications that when, uh, the, uh, when the information was given about particular civilian targets like hospitals, they were deliberately targeted. That's war crimes. There is a huge number of Tamils where there is strong, strong witness proofs that they handed themselves over alive to the government of Sri Lanka, to the armed forces of Sri Lanka, and who no one has seen since 2009, that's six years. Uh, it, will be, uh, I mean, it will be the most immensely positive news I've ever heard if they are still alive. Uh, you have, uh, to me, fairly well-documented cases like the son of Prabhakaran, 12 years old, we have pic there are pictures of him in the custody of the Sri Lankan army. Uh, he was given sweets. He's not still alive. Uh, and you have documented a vast number of, of, uh, of rapes. All this uh, come down to war crimes. Uh, the, what lacks is, of course, to prove this in a court so that the individual responsibility as to who made the actual orders uh, is uh, done but there is no doubt whatsoever that the decisions were taken at the absolute highest level of government. That distinguished also the Sri Lankan conflict from some other conflicts. In Sri Lanka, there were hardly any freelancers. Uh, nearly all violence in Sri Lanka was either done by the LTT or by the government forces. I mean, too, in some cases, say Tamil paramilitary forces, but the government of Sri Lanka could always turn these paramilitary groups on and off. So the responsibility comes back to the highest level of government, but the exact chain of command may uh, be an issue for, for a court. What is then uh, the difficult issue at the moment? The difficult issue is, of course, that still the majority of Sinhalese uh, are not really uh, enthusiastic, for, to put it mildly, uh, to bring this up. Uh, let's be uh, direct. In the, in the last election, Mahinda Rajapaksa got 55% of the Singala vote in Sri Lanka. Ranil uh, and Maitri Palasirisena won because they got overwhelming support from Tamils and from Muslims. Even more from Muslims than from Tamils, according to what we can read from the uh, electoral results. But when you are in a situation that the majority of the Singalese still have supported uh, Rajapaksa, of course the government would need to bring the majority opinion of the, uh, of the um, uh, of Sing Singalese with them uh, to get this, uh, 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 these uh, proceedings uh, uh, take off. And I think that will happen. It will take time. It took time in Serbia, it took time in, in, in uh, Chile and a number of other places. It will take some time. The way it could be done would be to establish such a climate in Sri Lanka that people can speak freely. Up to now, very few people, I mean, few Singala, uh, sorry, few Tamils, but I have not seen one Singalese really giving witness to what, what happened. Uh, a lot of the proof 
by Channel 4, for instance, is obviously made by, uh, by Singhalese. There's no Tamil who could have taken these, uh, these uh, phone videos. It's done by Singhalese. But not one Singhalese soldier up to now has stood up and told what happened. You must establish a climate so that people can speak. You must start investigating some of the most obvious crimes, like the killing, as I said, of La Santa Vikramatunga, of uh, Joseph Parajasingam, where they have made a couple of arrests. Let's see if they lead someone. Of the nearly 20 uh, workers of the of the uh, this uh, against uh, 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 organization, French organization against hunger, and through that gradually build the case for why also Singhalese should accept uh, that war crimes are treated in the way war crimes should be treated. Unfortunately, it cannot be done tomorrow. It will take some time, but I'm absolutely confident it will happen. Sure, briefly. Yeah, no, sorry, just a quick word. I mean, in response to Francis' question, which of course is a critical issue, um, I mean, to me it seems like part of this is about the, the perennial issue of, of strategy in engagement with post-transitional governments or transitional governments. You know, what's the right strategy or the most effective strategy? Um, with governments that have come into power in the aftermath of bad things, I mean, dictators or you know, authoritarian rulers or so on and so forth. And I think that, you know, so it's really like, it's so given the government we have today in Sri Lanka since Sirisena run, won the presidential election and Wickrama Singh is um, leading the government uh, as prime minister, you know, is the glass half empty or half full? I mean, it's the old question. And I think obviously the judgment call being made by key elements or countries in the international community is that it's half full, meaning that this government offers the best possible available chance for moving things forward in Sri Lanka on all fronts, economically, politically, accountability, and so on and so forth. Now, and I personally tend to subscribe to that view, but I think the thing that needs to be added to it, and this is where Francis' question you know, has its real bite, is that But if, you, if your judgment call is that the glass is half full, that doesn't mean that you simply sit back and just look at it. You need to engage critically. You need to hold accountable. You need to set up benchmarks. So, for example, we were discussing this yesterday at a seminar we both took part in. I mean, the UN report that Francis referred to, you know, this is actually has led to then a resolution adopted by the Human Rights Council, the UN Human Rights Council, that the government of Sri Lanka is a co-sponsor of. Now, they didn't need to do that, but they did. But the opportunity that creates is that now, account, you know, holding the government to account for actually benchmarking. So you know, you've said that you're going to do these things on account. 18 months down the line, the next time the council meets, OK, so let's look at it. What have you done? What haven't you done? What's the explanation? What's the justification? So I suppose what I'm really advocating is for a sort of glass half full perspective, but informed by a, um, a strong, tenacious, search to push the government and hold them to account on the promises that they've made. Thank you. Um, there's somebody toward the second row from the back. Please, you have your hand up several times. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Um, my question is about the future. I think uh, today's... Uh, I'm sorry, you are? Uh, my name is Gobi Ratnam. I'm a Tamil journalist. Um, today, the... Uh, when uh, there are so many people mentioned about the embeddiments of the peace process, and if we compare that with the current situation, there is no presence of liberation tigers of Tamil Ulam. Instead, a Tamil leadership which will only listen to the West, Norway, and everyone, they won't even ask questions. That's for Tamil side. In the Sinhala side, uh, the divided parties are together, the Chandrika and Ranil Vikrama singers together. If you look at the uh, Sri Lankan parliament, virtually there is no opposition. And in a funny situation, the opposition leader is an ardent supporter of the government. Uh, so in this situation, well, what will be the uh, prospects of having a, uh, a federal solution for Tamils? I'm asking this uh, from Mr. Solaim because he tweets a lot about uh, the, the current situation. He's very happy and every election results comes, he says he's, he's happy and all sorts of things. Okay. That was... I mean, obviously, there are, are different issues in Sri Lanka. We have discussed the issue of accountability. That's a key one. Uh, there need to be economic progress and prosperity. That's another one. 
but at the end, the Tamil conflict or the Tamil national issue in Sri Lanka was about what sort of self-rule will it be for Tamils in the Northeast. I mean, as Soda said, I mean, Tamils started a fight for federalism. At some point, many people wanted a separate state. And I think what is now given is an overwhelming mandate to the Tamil National Alliance. They want an absolute overwhelming mandate from the Tamils in Sri Lanka for to pursue a negotiated settlement with the government. There were a few people who were on the paramilitary side, like Douglas Devananda. They hardly got any votes. There were a few people who took a more kind of extremist nationalist position. They hardly got any votes. The Tamils in northern Sri Lanka uh, and the east voted with defeat, and they gave a strong, strong mandate <coughs> to the Tamil National Alliance. That mandate must be used, and it must be met by the Sri Lankan government in real negotiations to set out what will be the character, the type of devolution, federalism, self-rule, whatever na name you want to put on it. Uh, because at the, at the end of the day, there can be no solution to Sri Lanka without Tamil powers in the Northeast. Thank you. I think I, I've seen refreshments arriving and people leaving, and I think <laughs> time is going on. So I think I would like to just wrap up very quickly and ask each member of the panel if they have just one small comment just to finish off with, starting with Sutta. Oh, okay. Um, well, it's a book launch, and ultimately the comment has to be about the book. Uh, I've made some comments today which are not intended in any way as a criticism of the book, right? And as I said that at the, at the start, is that the book sets out a particular story I think that, um, and it does that extremely well. Uh, but to understand Sri Lanka, we'll have to look at other things. Um, the, uh, the point about the present, the glass may be half full, and the TNA has won a mandate. But um, I suspect most politicians in Sri Lanka will be thinking about the next election, not really about the solution. Yeah. Well, politicians always think about the next election. <laughs> They did that during the peace process as well um, in Sri Lanka, and that's a, a part of reality. And one of the quite impressive aspects of Sri Lanka is that through decades of terrorism, decades or periods of uh, um, states of emergency, um, other kinds of violence, outright and brutal war, and governments that uh, were more or less inclusive, if I put it mildly, democracy has prevailed. It's, uh, it has survived and prevailed, and that is impressive, uh, including the resounding mandate for uh, the TNA to uh, work for Tamil interests in uh, the coming period. And I think the book, um, provides an interesting reflection on right, the story of the, the peace process, but it also shed lights on, shed some light on issues that need to be taken forward in the peace process that is democracy, uh, and uh, where the actors in the Sri Lankan politics are now the ones to uh, carry the issues forward and hopefully bring them to a better solution than we've seen uh, in the past. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I mean, we are discussing a book which hardly anyone in the audience have read. Uh, that's always uh, a difficulty. So please read the book. Uh, please contact us if, if you have issues, if you have further questions, if you have disagreements. Uh, we are ready, at least I'm ready to come and discuss on the different occasions. You can contact me. That's very easy. Erik.Solheim, that's the name, at OECD.org. Send me emails and I, I will... Uh, I will try to be polite and try to respond. <laughs> uh, secondly, on, on the, uh, I, I'm fundamentally optimist. I'm on the glass half full uh, type. I think this is the historical chance of Sri Lanka. Not that I do uh, underestimate the difficulties. Not that I believe that Randy Vikramasinghe is a saint. However, if there were two heroes of the peace process, it was Anton Balasingam which Soda know very well, uh, and it was Randy Vikramasinghe from my perspective. And, but this is, you can read the book and make your own uh, judgment. So there will be no plain sailing. Uh, the Tamil, I think, also need to consider new and more innovative ways of doing politics, because the Tamil politics of, since at least 1980 has been either kind of 
very limited parliamentarian politics at a high level, or the brutal military ways of the LTT, and there have been much less civilian strikes, hunger strikes, uh, political manifestations, all the other ways of attracting uh, political uh, uh, support. I mean, there is no, I mean, the Tamil uh, uh, national issue in Sri Lanka or Tamil demands will not be resolved as a gift from the Sinhalese. It will have to come through struggle. However, that struggle cannot be military, it must be a political struggle. So my encouragement to the Tamils, I mean the Tamils around here, is to consider new ways of doing this politics. I'm not saying it's easy, but there is a complete new opening for that after the fall of Rajapaksa. The time of Rajapaksa was very dangerous to do it. It's, much, uh, it's a much more opening now. So I'm fundamentally optimistic. Uh, I think uh, uh, we will see uh, uh, democracy prevailing. I think we will see uh, many of the war crimes coming up for some resolution and openness. I think we'll see rapid economic development, and that will not resolve problems, but it's always easier to resolve co conflicts if there is rapid development. Sri Lanka is now at a 7% economic uh, growth, which is uh, with, with, with India is uh, f fairly impressive. And the North is, of course, now very underdeveloped after the war. And the Tamil diaspora has an enormous opportunity. Go back, invest, use your, use your abilities. You are among the best educated, most successful people on the planet. And you have a lot to offer. I mean, Tamil diaspora, I mean, uh, they're all stockbrokers, dentists, uh, doctors, lawyers, whatever. I mean, I still recall some Tamils in Norway coming to my rel relatively modest apartment, Norwegian style, and they said, I mean, how can a minister live like that? <laughs> <laughs> they had a huge, huge house in some of the more uh, affluent suburbs uh, of Oslo. So please go back and use your abilities to promote economic development. But at the end, of course, there must be negotiations on a political settlement uh, of, the, of the Tamil issue, because without that, uh, um, everything else in the long term will be undermined. Thank you. Mark, the last word will be mine. The penultimate word can be yours. Could you say something? Mm. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, really just quickly, two things. I mean, the first is, you know, Eric encouraged you to read the book, and of course I agree. Um, please encourage others to read it. I say this from a purely impartial third party uh, standpoint. No, um, of course, it'll be as people get the chance to read it. I, and I know Sutha has read at least a lot of it, and so I really appreciate those kind of informed, I mean, I appreciate all comments, but those kind of really on the, on the substance, that that's really what I, I want to hear, or I would hope to hear. The second thing I just, um, you know, w wanted to say um, was that, I mean, in terms of, of, the, uh, of the future, um, I, we haven't discussed it so much here, but, you know, I, when I wrote this book, I mean, there was the journalist sort of side of it was important to me right, in reporting this story or writing up this story. But the other thing is, as someone who's been very engaged in sort of issues of conflict resolution, conflict management, and so on, I think, you know, understanding how peace processes work, whether they succeed or fail, but just, and in particular, how facilitators and negotiators do their job. This is essential information in today's world. Um, we, we, we need this information. And, um, you know, I would just maybe highlight one uh, lesson or reflection which comes right, I put right at the end of the book. It's something that Eric said to me on this precise subject about how the Norwegians had approached Sri Lanka and what they'd learned from it. And Eric said, I think I'm quoting him very, he said, you know, um, listen to everyone, talk to everyone. And I think if we think about the ISIS's of, the, of today, you know, the groups that people, some say, we shouldn't talk to under any circumstances. Well, at least the Norwegian approach in Sri Lanka suggests that that may not be the most sensible strategy if we at least want to move things forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, can, I, can I just finish very quickly by thanking you all very much for coming. Um, there are some drinks waiting for us outside. If you um, are not a regular attender at, at SOAS events and you wish to receive a weekly bulletin of South Asia-related seminars and talks and so on, then please just drop a line, an email to SSAI for SOAS South Asia Institute at soas.ac.uk and you will receive a weekly email telling you what's going on here in relation to South Asia. 
Um, I would like to finish this by thanking very much indeed, um, particularly Sutta for pulling, pulling this all together. Um, our Norwegian guests, um, very much indeed for your, for your generous contribution to this evening's discussion, which was very much appreciated. And Mark, we'd like to all, I think, congratulate you on this book, which I think we can now pr pronounce well and truly launched. So, <laughs> so that is one final round of applause, please. <laughs>